public instead. Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? The women with the least likelihood of getting pregnant are the ones most worried about having abortions. On January 6th of 2021, you had tens of thousands of people peacefully protesting. So, it's not a right-wing conspiracy theory. It's not QAnon. It's real. <laughs> hey, good morning, everybody. It's about 9.30 on the 15th on Monday. Um, the, over the weekend, there was an assassination attempt on the former president. And as everyone else has echoed, uh, a condemnation of the political violence uh, in this country that has been rising for years, um, this is almost its apotheosis. I will surprise you by saying I am grateful that Donald Trump was not uh, severely injured. I am praying for the families of the, 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 the local volunteer fire chief there, Corey, who died. And I am praying for the recovery of the other folks who were injured by the shooter. I am, uh, I am, I am deeply, deeply, deeply concerned that we will misunderstand this moment as a people and as a country. And by misunderstand, I'm going to say this, this is a 20 year old shooter. He's the same pathologies, the same sickness, the same broken broken soul that unfortunately has affected so many young men in this country and he's a 20 year old kid and on the one hand you hear people on on the left and the democratic side saying he was a republican he was a conservative there must be something weird why did he shoot trump and on the right you're hearing he was an antifa progressive and why did he shoot trump he shot trump for the same reason broken young men shoot up classrooms he he shot trump for the same reason um broken men shoot up the tree shot up the tree of life synagogue there is something broken in our culture and our society and the idea that calling trump uh, a danger to democracy was what caused this 20 year old kid who had no connection to social media to the world largely is going to lead us into i think a box canyon um, because Donald Trump is a danger to democracy. Donald Trump is a danger to the Republic. Donald Trump has a plan under Project 2025 and Agenda 47 and all the stated objectives they have that will destroy this country. I refuse to pretend that Donald Trump is none of those things because he is all of those things. Now, is political violence the solution? Of course it's not. There is literally no one in this country with with a, a single sane brain cell and a shred of integrity who thinks that political violence solves the problem. And I want to say this very clearly. I want to be very, very, very crisp and clear about this. Political rhetoric on the right has a tone and a character in the era of Trump in the last nine years that increasingly is about calling anyone who is not fully on board with MAGA, the devil, communist, Marxist, pedophile, criminal, radical, Antifa, Black Lives Matter. And they have framed this out for a lot of America, that there is a broad conspiracy against all that is righteous and good in, in this country. And it's not true. But it is effective. It's good divisive politics. And the idea that we're hearing right now that Trump was shot because the left calls him a danger, the left calls him Hitler, compares him to Hitler. Guys, wake up. There is a tone and rhetoric on the right. Look at Mark Robinson in North Carolina. Look at any number of these people. I will tell you, um, in the last 48 hours, I've been uh, attacked by Marjorie Taylor Greene. She blames me for the assassination because I'm mean to Donald Trump in the, on, on cable TV. Um, 
a uh, hundred other MAGA commentators and social media types and scam influencers are attacking me saying, oh, well, you once said the donors have to put a bullet in Trump. Folks, metaphor and rhetoric are different. Folks, don't hide from a confrontation about Trump. Don't walk away from the fight. He is not a martyr. He is not a saint. He is not a good man. He is not a great man. I am glad he lived. I am, I am thankful to God that he lived. I am very, very, very grateful that providence spared his life. I am, I am, I am beyond grateful. I think it would have broken this country in a fundamental way. Now, I want to talk for one second about the politics that I see coming forward here. Everyone on the right has declared the election's over. A lot of people on the left have declared the election's over. Trump will get a bump in the polls, guys. He will. It will absolutely be. It will absolutely happen. Okay. But in the history of this country, sadly, political violence has been a through line. It, it has been a through line in this, in this country. We have seen this show before. Gerald Ford, they tried to assassinate Gerald Ford twice, and he lost the presidency. Okay. Um, the, the, Bobby Kennedy uh, was assassinated. The Democrats lost the presidency. You go on and on and on and on through this. Teddy Roosevelt, who was shot, lost the, lost the presidency. It, it, this is not an automatic get, get into the White House free card. And Donald Trump's staff has had a, a moment where they realize if he should shut up, they could, they could easily win. But he can't shut up. He has no discipline. He is in, unable. Nothing changes about Trump. This, the fact that his ear got nicked by a bullet or, or by the teleprompter breaking, we're not sure what the full story is yet. We don't know the details. Did not stop him from going golfing yesterday. Trump always returns to the mean. He always returns to who he actually is. The performative Trump that throws the red meat, that makes the crowd scream, We'll be back. That's the guy that alienates 52% of America every single day. And this race is going to be close. It's going to be hard fought. But don't pull back from the political fight where you engage him directly, honestly, truthfully because of this horrific and, and revolting moment. Don't pull back from saying that Donald Trump is a danger to America's future because that is the truth. That is reality. That is realistic. I don't see this race as, as the, I don't see the fundamentals of the race as having changed as much as some people do. I could be wrong. This could have ensured his reelection, um, but I don't think it did because I know who he is. I know what he is. And in the hundred or so days we have left, he will always be himself. He will have a moment in the convention that that rises high, and then again the polling bump is always there after the convention. It's always there after a, a trauma like this. Um, but keeping up the fight, staying in the battle, that is incumbent upon all of us, or we will descend into a culture where the politics is is decided by violence. We have to beat him at the ballot box. I want him defeated, humiliated wrecked. I want him driven from public life. I've never once asked anyone or said to anyone that this country would be better off if he was dead by an assassin's bullet because it's an insane position to have. He will be better off if we beat him at the ballot box so soundly and, and, the, and make it so clear that America rejects Trump and Trumpism and that's a moment we can be proud of. This weekend was a moment for this country to hang its head. Thanks, everybody. Hey, folks, and welcome back to the Enemies List. I'm your host, Rick Wilson. Uh, we are joined today by Bakari Sellers. Bakari is a, a guy you have seen around on various cable networks. Uh, we've been on a, I guess we've been on a couple, a couple panels together over the years. And, uh, but, but he's got uh, a lot of insights, I think, into, um, into the world we live in today. Um, in terms of the politics of, uh, well, not only just the politics of politics, but the politics of race in the country. Um, 
Bakari served in the South Carolina House. Uh, he was a Democratic nominee for lieutenant governor down there. Uh, and in the in the most recent iteration, he has written a, a terrific new book, um, once again, about race in this country. And and I think it's something that we should talk a little bit about today because it is part of the part of the the, the discourse, I think, that is kind of missing out in this campaign. But first, we're recording this um, on Monday, the 15th of July. And obviously, over the weekend, there was an assassination attempt on the former president. And that is something that is that is altering the shape of the campaign right now. Uh, and altering the shape of the dialogue right now. So, Bakari, first, I want to start with that. Let's get. I want to get your feelings on where you see uh, this is attempted assassination uh, of Trump altering the political dialogue we're having right now. So, first, I mean, I, I think that we are um, skilled enough um, as um, beings a part of this participatory democracy to have nuanced conversations. Yes, and I start with that preface, because I want to extend my sincerest condolences to the individual who lost his life. Um, I'm thank, I thank God. I mean, I I pray for, I pray for all our leaders. That's just part of like the Episcopal church. So I say prayers prayers for, for Donald Trump, just as much as I say prayers for Joe Biden, but I'm very prayerful and thankful that, that um, Donald Trump is still here with us. Um, not just because of of he's a father and a husband and, you know, I, I, I never wish death upon anyone, but also selfishly because a bullet one, one inch to another direction, I'm not sure where we are as yeah. a country. I don't even think we, we probably canceled this interview this morning because things we were that yeah. much, you know, are, are, are in that much disarray. And so I guess selfishly, I'm also thankful that that did not occur. So and then last but not least, all the Trump supporters that were there, their lives will forever be changed, because whenever you are part of that traumatic type of experience, you sure. are changed as a human being. Sure. Um, politically, I'd argue that not much will change. Um, I, I think mm-hmm. Frank Luntz got part of it right by saying that people will settle back into their um, respective corners. I think that's right. Um, the the polls that were coming out that were in the field prior to the assassination attempt, um, the most recent polls, I believe it was a CBS poll, did seven swing states. Joe Biden was down by two. He was mm-hmm. down by two nationwide. In North Carolina, he was down by four. The unique part about that, and I was having some interaction with Ron Brownstein, who, by the way, I don't know if you've had him on the show or not, Rick, but he's the, the you know I need to get him on the show. Yeah. That's a good that's a good point. Let's uh, we'll yeah. make a note of yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things that he outlined in that poll, which a lot of people are doing, is they have these very skewed numbers for minorities where uh, Donald Trump is bringing 20 percent of African-Americans and 45 percent of, of Hispanics. And, I, you know, if any if you or any of your listeners believe that's going to be the case, <laughs> yeah, I have many bridges to sell. you. I have many bridges to sell you. And so I just think this race is going to be extremely close. And history teaches us that as well. I mean, look. I don't believe there's a such thing as a sympathy vote in the country. Um, RFK was killed in 1968 and Democrats got their ass kicked. Uh, Gerald Gerald Ford got, they attempted to assassinate him not once, but twice. Um, And he he was beaten um, by, uh, by Jimmy Carter. So I'm not sure there is. Teddy Roosevelt was shot and still lost that year. Correct. Yeah. So, you know, and I just think that what I'm not going to do is be gaslit. And this is my, you know, political commentator come in, but I'm not going to be mm-hmm. gaslit into not referring to Donald Trump or his agenda as a threat to democracy because it is. Absolutely. I'm not going to stop addressing the dangers of authoritarianism because that is true. Um, and I believe that we're nuanced enough for me to be able to say that Donald Trump is a fundamental threat to democracy because Project 2025 for someone sure. like me is devastating and eroding everything we believe to hold true but also pray for his safety and security and health. I just don't want another four years of him as president. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point, Bakari, is that is that this idea that a moment of unacceptable violence and, and, and unacceptable, there's just not a, there's not a, there's not a single iota. There's no one in this country who believes that 
using violence against your political opponents is legitimate. Um, but but a moment of violence like this that that comes from a a uh, uh, it comes in a campaign where we have a a person pro- promising to implement a vision of America that takes us back to the pre 1850s on race, on economics, on trade, on women, on society, that that we shouldn't stand up every day and fight back as hard as we can every single day. Because I, I, I truly believe that we are at a moment of great national peril um, if the ideas behind – and folks, it is Project 2025. That's the wellspring of all of it, everybody. But it's – Agenda 47, Project 2025, the Republican platform, it's all the same gumbo. It's all the same soup. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is. And, you know, I am, you know, I'm watching as we sit here today. I, I don't know when the show is going to air as a podcast or so I'm, I'm very cautious about timing, et cetera. But let yeah. me just say that as we sit here today, they've also pulled Morning Joe off the air this morning. Which Yeah, I, I found that very sense. troubling this morning, honestly. I mean, it's like a surrender. I mean, I don't yep. understand. I don't understand why we can't continue the debate. I mean, I, I, you know, I thought, I thought the president last night was extremely strong in his remarks. Right. I felt I so felt, too. I felt, you know, because look, I mean, from Gabby Giffords to Steve Scalise, um, you know, from Nancy Pelosi's husband, I believe it's Frank. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's also Paul, amazing. Paul Pelosi. Paul. Paul. I, that's always amazing when you were just referred to as your husband. I, I kind of, as your as somebody's <laughs> husband, I kind of, I kind of like that. <laughs> People just, I've called him Nancy Pelosi's husband 25 million times. <laughs> <ago. laughs> right, right. um, to Gretchen Whitmer's ki- kidnapping, you yeah. know, uh, plan. I mean, this is just, this is not a, and, and then, and then you have this narrative now um, that Trump is turning the page and, you know, I, I, anybody who gets shot in the face that does change somebody. However, we have yep. decades of history to show that that is going to take one hell of a U-turn for that to be a unifying uh, messenger and someone who's not divisive. And so I, I just, we are becoming paralyzed in this country because of fear. And I wrote about that in the book because mm-hmm. there are people who have been utilizing fear the sure. Trump, the Tucker Carlson's of the world to get us to a point like this. And I find that to be incredibly dangerous. You know, I want to, I, now, now that you mentioned it, I do want to bring up the book. Folks, the book is called The Moment, Thoughts on Race, on the Race Reckoning That Wasn't and How We Can All Move Forward Now. So, Bakari, uh, talk to us about how you came to write the book and and where do you think the big inflection point of uh, of of America's very difficult journey uh, on race. Where, 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 where's, where's the failure mode of our decade, of our generation uh, on race? <clears throat> I, I don't, you know, that's a good question. I, it's hard. That's a hard question to answer. I would highlight, though, that 2020 was kind of indicative of that inflection. I hate saying, I'm like Jonah Goldberg. I hate saying inflection point. But I that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of what it was in 2020. I, I hate the word too, but I end up using it more than I yeah, want all the time. 2020 was pretty much what that would be. Um, because you had Ahmaud Arbery, you had Breonna Taylor, you had George Floyd, and you yep. had a very devastating pandemic. And no one really analyzed the impetus behind the results that we saw. No one, no one really talked about mm-hmm. why. COVID was so devastating to our communities because we live in food deserts, don't have access to quality health care, you know, drinking, um, drinking water that is not potable. I mean, it's just no one really wanted to have a conversation about those systems. And we missed that mark. We got checks right. and everybody went home. I thought we were on the precipice of a third reconstruction because people were pouring out of the streets, et cetera. Yeah. And we just missed that mark. And I just think that's kind of indicative of where we are when we have these opportunities and it's also indicative of where leadership is. And let me also echo one more thing. We are both a part of the two main reasons that democracy is decaying. And I think sure. you would acknowledge as such, and I do as well, but we're kind of there to fight the good fight because if we weren't, I would argue it would be worse. But one is the 24-hour cable news cycle and the other is social 100%. media. I mean, those two 100%. things. I, I, um, I was about to tweet this morning and I chose against it. I may hit send on it just because I didn't really feel like dealing with um, 
the bullshit that comes along with it. But yeah. Um, one of the more interesting, fascinating, I wrote democracy eroding transactions that ever happened in the history of the country would be when Jack sold Twitter to Elon Musk. I, I sure. really do not wait for history to go back and look at the interconnectivity between what we see now and the hotbed of isms, racism. I mean, look, this is a, this is a microcosm, a perfect example, Rick. They are now using the word DEI to castigate the women of the Secret Service who put right. themselves in between the line of fire of, of Donald Trump and who knows what. Yep. And, and, and the woman who leads the, the Secret Service today, um, if she was a DEI hire, then she served in the, in, on the front lines of the Secret Service in detail roles for 27 years, folks. So... Uh, it, this this imaginary DEI thing, um, it, I I I find it I'm profoundly offensive because you know I I know Secret Service uh, agents I know Secret Service both uniformed and 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 detail agents and these people what you saw this week you know they jumped in front of the president while the gun is still firing folks. That's their job. That's what they do. And I guarantee that's what she would have done, too, although they're going to try to turn her into, as you said, you know, th their DEI narrative. They're they're obsessed about that, about that particular um, about that particular line of of argument, which is, you know, a, I think a garbage argument. But here we are. Yeah. But, you know, when you look at all of these, when you look at and so you started you started the show. I mean, this this show is probably not going to have a direct through line. It's such a big thing that we're dealing. It with. is. We got a lot of a lot, there's a lot of moving parts <laughs> Off, right now. Yeah, so a lot of off ramps going on here. But I mean, that's just the necessary conversation. I mean, we've already covered social media, and Morning Joe and, you know, race and all those other things. I mean, but when you ask where we are as a country and where we go, I don't know. Um, the weird part for me is that for the next, it, it's like certain people have capitulated. Sure. Where you and I are fighters. And for the next five, six days, the world is oh. Donald Trump's oyster. Yeah. Listen, and, and the one thing, and I've, I've, I'll, I'm going to talk about this some more later today. Um, the one thing I want to, I want to remind people of is that Donald Trump is always his own worst enemy. And and he he has a very great difficulty um, maintaining anything that isn't actually what's in his head, and so he will end up, and, and the Republicans will end up with a with the, the with the regular Donald Trump, with the normal Donald Trump that that drives Americans insane. Um, he will go back. He this you know Donald Trump calling for unity is like. You know, me calling for to you know to, to for 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 unity. It's just it doesn't matter. I you know we 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 know the country is divided, and and we know the country is 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 in different media silos and so on. So I, I just I I don't think that Trump ever maintains uh, much of a much of a a, a disciplined uh, style. Well, the so this is where I would argue that Susie Wilde and Jason Miller have mm -hmm. done a hell of a job because as a lawyer, I do criminal mm -hmm. defense work a lot as well, as well as civil sure. rights work. You can never control your client, right? It's just the wildest, because he's your client for a reason, right? So it's kind of the wildest thing ever. Yeah. And regardless of what you think about Jason and Susie, outside of Donald Trump, they have somewhat controlled the chaos. And then after the debate, they got him to sit down and shut up for 10 days. Yeah, they sure did. And that was a, that was a political miracle. Um, and, and I think they did, they used the one lure they knew would work. Donald, go golfing, go work on your golf game. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he, he said, he said he could beat you in golfing. You should go yeah. sharpen up in case we yeah, do that. Tune up Donald. <laughs> um, and I, I, I can tell you, they were already a little worried about, they were always a little worried about, uh, you know, Donald was stalking around Mar-a-Lago and Bedminster, like he, tearing the paint off the walls because he was bored. He is quickly and easily bored. And look, it, 
in a world where Donald Trump was a normal Republican or normal Democratic candidate, and this had happened, he would go to the convention, he would talk about unity, he would not try to feed the monster, and he would not try to throw like just red meat, red meat, red meat, chum in the water sort of thing, right? But I, I have, you know, I'm, I'm, you and I are both pretty close observers of this guy, and he has a profound inability to discipline himself uh, when it comes to, um, you know, saying what's on his mind. He I'm has not, a profound that, inability I'm not to even not, that concerned yeah. about him because that cake is baked. Yeah. I am interested to see people like Mark Robinson, who is an sure, who is an anti-black, anti-Semite, ignorant black man running for <laughs> running for governor in North Carolina, who said there needs to be a killing. Just like well, some week. folks need killing. Yes, thank and, you. And, I mean, look, we, we're having a lot of discussions in the last twenty-four hours, like how, all this heated rhetoric. <laughs> okay, well, if heated rhetoric causes public behavior. Explain to me how you're going to have a guy who's the governor of of a state, um, who who is out there saying the things that Mark Robinson is saying. I mean, he he is, I, and I can tell you, I've talked to some Republicans in North Carolina who were like, "This guy could cost us the state because he's that crazy." Yeah. I don't think he's, but I don't think he's an outlier anymore inside that party. Well, yeah, the, and the, the reason and the reason you're right, and that's why I, sh- I shifted the the kind of paradigm from analyzing yeah. what Donald Trump is going to say this week to everybody else is because sure. Look at, look at what Tim Scott tweeted. Look at what JD Vance tweeted, yep. and then Mike so Collins the, from Georgia. I was going to say those are the degrees, and then you got him and and Marjorie Taylor Greene, which just called us a bunch of all types of names and said it's good yep. versus evil. So I yeah, mean, she was blaming me for the for the shooting last night on Twitter. So that's nice. Well, just take, <laughs> protect yourself and your family. Yeah, I, I, know. We're, we're, I, mean, I, I was, yeah. I'm not a big fan of the Wall Street Journal uh, editorial page, but I would encourage everybody to read the January, the January, no, excuse me, the July 15 editorial page this morning that called mm-hmm. out and said the people, I'm not a big fan of ostracizing people either, but the people who are, have an inability to quell uh, this type of, of dialogue need to be ostracized. And they did a little both sides on it, but they really focused in on the Republicans who were who were uh, trafficking in these conspiracy theories that we see. Right. And look there, uh, you know, you mentioned the DEI conspiracy. Um, you know, the, you mentioned the, the 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 fact that they're trying to turn the head of the, uh, the Secret Service into the demon here. Um, but I think there's a I think there's a real moment that we're in where where. We also have to be honest about something else in this case, and I and I, I I'm I'm going to say this. I'm probably going to get in trouble in this, but here we go. The kid who pulled the trigger does not look like he was particularly political. In in the only ways he was political that we can determine, um, you know, he was a registered Republican. His friends say he was a conservative, but I think this is one of those lost boys. In this country today, I think this kid um, was lonely. I think this kid had a dead end life. I think he grew up on video games. He was bullied as bullied uh, by all reports. He was bullied in school. He didn't have friends. He didn't have a friend group. He didn't have a girlfriend. And I think this is the same profile and pathology where he got an a, an unlocked gun. In the house, and, and folks, I own guns. I own, I own a number of guns. It's also all in a safe, and the safe state. is in a locked room. It's I also an open carry state that if they would have engaged him, they might have been able to detain him. But for what? Right. Because carrying an AR in yeah. that, I mean, in Pennsylvania, around is not a crime. Yeah, and, and 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 for all that, and for all that, this kid is unfortunately the same profile of dozens of other broken young men who go into a classroom with a gun or, or, or go into a public place with a gun or go into a synagogue with a gun. Um, and they come from this broken world. And, and I think we have to look at that because when you're 20 years old and you're in that sort of, that sort of, you've had that sort of broken upbringing, this isn't some, deeply considered political response to what's going on in the world. The guy apparently was like just a, a not on social media, not in, not, not a news consumer. I, 
the ideation with becoming something when your life is pretty much a nothing, I think drives some of these cases. And it's, and I'm, I'm not saying this as articulately as I want to, but that combination of a, of a very broken culture for young men in this country um, and, and, and a very broken culture for, for young lower middle class kids in this country, um, I think there's something we've got to think about there. No, that, I, you know, you're not beyond, wrong. I mean, beyond trying not to wrong. say that this kid about... went out there because he was an Antifa operative and all that other garbage we're here. No, I mean, I think there's a direct line between this kid and Dylan Roof, this kid yeah. and the Buffalo shooter. hundred I mean, percent. Do they all fall in this? Now, they're, they, I mean, people may not be able to weave them from the same fabric, but they came, they come from like the same cloth, right? If that, right. if that makes sense. Like, so I agree. I, I, uh, you know, I've looked at this from another way, Rick, and I'm just, this is my first time saying it out loud, but outside of my, my home, but my wife and I were having barbecue last night as good South Carolinians do. God bless. <laughs> and, um, you know, we both echoed the fact we were really, really glad that the shooter was not black, Muslim, yep, Hispanic, wasn't an illegal. Can you just imagine the news cycle? This country would be on fire. The, yes. the, the country would be on fire. Let's be let's be very honest about it. The world would burn if that happened. It, it, we would we'd be in a very very dark place. And, and and I'm also glad that he wasn't antifa or progressive or any of that stuff. This is just not this this kid has a series of pathologies, and and is and I must say this you know. Uh, his father had a responsibility. If you have a kid in the house who can't buy a beer, the guns need to be in a gun safe. They need to be locked up. Young men who are 20 years old are not cognitively capable of handling things like that. And, 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 and you know, Scott Galloway writes a lot about the pathologies that affect young men in this country. And, and it is regrettable, it is horrible that this guy went out for whatever the, whatever that set of pathologies drove him to, um, you know, a man almost lost his his uh, his life on the stage that would have caught, set the country on fire, and a, a a local volunteer fire chief lost his life uh, from one of the stray shots, and two other people are critically injured, and so you know we've got a country that we've got some cultural problems that underpin these things, and and this kid. This kid is going to become a tragic example, um, I, I think, to others because they these kids understand the world is sort of stacked up on them, and very often they think this is their one way to have a moment. And yeah, I also think that like tragic. I think that, I don't think we'll change much because I think we're looking at change the wrong way. After Gabby Giffords died, everybody was, I mean, not died, excuse me, was shot, and the young lady, I believe she was eleven or twelve, was was killed. Yeah, people were saying that we need to change, but we keep electing horrible human beings. And so I don't think that on, on both sides, <laughs> I don't think that we should kind of expect that change to come from Washington, DC or from state capitals. I think that change has to, we have to get out of our own silos and rededicate ourselves to becoming community again in our respective yeah. areas. Yeah, right I now it's hard right. to survive out here. You're going, you're going out, you're going to work, you're coming home, you live in silos, you don't know your neighbors, you're not having dinner at home anymore. The fabric of, of community is no longer there. And you can't look to Marjorie Taylor Greene to be a leader. You just simply can't. Yeah, it, it is. It is a it is a grim moment, folks. And and I think I think it's, uh, you know, uh, and Bakari, the reason I like the book so much is that it is a honest look at, at a failure of America. But that doesn't mean that, that that we shouldn't keep swinging at it. We keep trying to 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 repair it. That arc sometimes bends slower than other times. Right now, the arc has been bending very slowly the last few decades. And but I have, I mean I, I like you have a lot of hope and a lot of faith. King said only when it's darkest, you know, only when it's darkest can you see the stars. Yeah. Um, yep. And so I, I'm I'm with you. I, I just think that we have to be resolute and get through this period of time that we're in. Absolutely. Well, Bakari Sellers, I want to thank you so much for coming on the enemies list today. Uh, look forward to talking to you again soon, my friend, and uh, and all the best to you. Please be and safe. Folks, and folks, uh, hang on a second. Uh, Phineas, you're going to have to give me a, a, let me, give me a cut here.
Um, I want to read the book title again, the full uh, title, and I want to read it like I'm not an idiot. <clears throat> Folks, Bakari's book is The Moment. Thoughts on race? Thought. <laughs> Slow down. Folks, yeah, I know. <laughs> Folks, Bakari's book is excellent, and it's called The Moment. Thoughts on the race reckoning that wasn't and how we can all move forward now. <laughs> hey, folks. I don't know your name yet. I don't know the name of the person that's going to be on the enemies list for a long time now. I don't, I don't, I don't know your name yet, but I, I will know your name. I, I will know your name. I will find your name, and I will make you pay. After Donald Trump uh, faced an assassin's bullet, this weekend, death threats to my family started to come in again. Now, look, guys, I've been in this fight for nine years. I've had death threats. 99.9% of them are complete you know, lunatics screaming into the void. Some of them are more serious. Some of them, as the one that right now has the F have the FBI involved. But when you send an email to the Lincoln Project that says... I'm coming to kill Rick Wilson. Puts my home address in there. I've even seen that before. <laughs> Many times. My address is out there. But you motherfuckers put my daughter's home address and threatened to kill my daughter and my children who are all visiting there this weekend. You threatened my fucking kids. I will find you. I am, a, I am the fucking weird-ass Republican, ex-Republican version of Liam Neeson. I promise you. I will not rest. You will be found. We will fucking destroy you. Do not threaten my children. Do not threaten my fucking children. Do not threaten my fucking children. That's it. <laughs>